York City. Here on this 4th of August, 1735, the long-delayed trial of John Peter Zenger is about to begin. He stands accused of the crime of libel against the person and character of His Excellency Colonel William Cosby, Governor of the Provinces of New York and New Jersey. Informed observers believe that Zenger's chances for acquittal are dim. They point out that he is heavily handicapped. The governor controls the court, presided over by Chief Justice James Delancey. Zenger's two attorneys have been disbarred, and the Crown has appointed John Chambers, a young and relatively unknown attorney, to defend Zenger. This case has been waiting to come to trial for eight months. It has attracted considerable attention both here and in England. There are many who see it. August 4th, 1735, New York City. You are there. John Peter Zenger, a colonial printer, stands before a government-controlled court determined to convict him for libel. CBS takes you back 214 years to one of the most celebrated trials in our nation's history, the trial which established our treasured heritage of freedom of the press. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. When CBS is there, you are there. You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on historical fact and quotation. Walter Hamden plays Mr. Andrew Hamilton in today's broadcast. And now... A crowded courtroom in colonial New York and John Daly. The action here in the colonies is about to begin. The courtroom is packed with people who have come from points as far away as Boston and Philadelphia to witness this trial. Chief Justice Delancey and his associate, Justice Phillips, have not appeared yet. So now to our CBS News headquarters for the trial and the latest developments in this dramatic case. Go ahead, Quincy Howe. There's a lot more to this case than meets the eye. The issue is not just whether John Peter Zenger is guilty of libeling Governor Cosby. The larger question is, shall the people of these colonies have the right to protest against what they regard as arbitrary and oppressive rule of any and all crown-appointed governors? Two years ago, when Colonel Cosby became governor, he began to tax the people in what they considered a high-handed manner. It's also alleged that he suppressed their civil rights. When the colonists tried to get some relief in the city council, the governor removed the senior member of that body, the beloved and respected Rip Van Dam. When the people took their case to the courts, Governor Cosby replaced the chief justice, Mr. Lewis Morris, with Mr. James Delancey, who will preside over today's trial. Deprived of their normal avenues of protest, several influential New Yorkers got together and backed John Peter Zenger in issuing a newspaper, the New York Weekly Journal, which published many unsigned articles attacking the governor. Eight months ago, Cosby arrested Zenger on a warrant charging him with printing seditious libels, and Justice Delaney, Delancey rather, set the bail so high that Zenger had to stay in jail. If the jury finds Zenger guilty, the New York Weekly Journal will certainly go out of business. Also, many colonists believe that such a precedent will tend to discourage opposition to the government and will throttle a free press. Uh, just a moment, the sheriff has brought Zenger into the courtroom, so back to John Daly. Zenger is being led into the prisoner's dock, and the crowd has broken into a spontaneous demonstration. Zenger just waved at his wife, Mrs. Anna Zenger, who is sitting next to John Chambers, his attorney, and Don Hollenbeck is with Mrs. Zenger also, so over to Don Hollenbeck. The bailiff seems to be quieting this demonstration for Zenger. Mrs. Zenger, is this the first time you've seen your husband since his imprisonment? The first time. This is the first time. And how do you think he looks? Dreadful. Terrible. He's lost so much weight. So much. Mrs. Zenger, there's, there's been some talk that the articles in the journal, those that the governor specifically objected to, were not written by your husband. Is is that true? Oh, John printed the article. I know, I know that, but they were never signed. Who actually wrote them? That is what His Excellency would like to know. That is why he threw my husband in jail, to find out. He was sure he could make John tell who wrote the articles. Then he could punish them. Even if my husband didn't confess, the governor thought that with John in jail, the paper would be finished. But his high and mighty excellency failed in both his plots. 
John would not tell, and the journal kept on being printed. We yes, never it, yes, it presence. certainly did, and much of the credit for that belongs to you, Mrs. Singer. And now that the trial's begun, how do you think it's going to go? The jury will find my husband innocent. They must. If they convict John, the only weapon we have against Cosby and all the others like him is lost. Our voice is choked off. We're struck dumb, and Cosby can run riot over us. And we will have neither the right to protest nor the voice to cry out with. But if John is acquitted, as I pray the Lord he will be, the men everywhere in America will be able to speak out as free men must speak out. Without fear and freely. Thank you, Mrs. Anna Zinger. Now the sheriff is asking that the aisles be cleared. It seems the trial is about to start, so back to John Daly. The aisles are being cleared, and this place is taking on some semblance of order. Mr. Richard Bradley, the attorney general who will prosecute Zinger, is standing at the crown's table. Uh, he seems very complacent. He's smiling, and at the moment setting his powdered wig at just the right position on his head. And now the bailiff has reached up to the judge's right. bench and is pounding the gavel. Chief Justice Delancey and Associate Justice Phillips are entering the courtroom from their chambers. They're going up to their places on the bench. The spectators have risen. Let's listen. Oyez, oyez. The New York Supreme Court, third of August, in the ninth year of the reign of our sovereign lord, King George II, Justices Delancey and Phillips presiding, all those having business before this court draw near, give your attention, and ye shall be heard. Be seated. The clerk will read the calendar. The Crown versus John Peter Zanger, printer of New York City. Mr. Attorney General, are you prepared for the Crown? We are ready, Your Honor. Mr. John Chambers, are you prepared for the defendant? May it please Your Honor. Yes, Mr. Chambers, what is it? May I address Your Honor to say that I have just been advised that I am to have the cooperation of another attorney in the presentation of my case. Another attorney, sir? I ask, sir, that you declare to be qualified at this bar, the distinguished member of the bar of our neighboring colony, Pennsylvania, Mr. Andrew Hamilton. Andrew Hamilton will defend Singer. Hamilton, the most distinguished, the most noted attorney in the colonies, is here in this courtroom, and he's going to help defend John Peter Singer. He was sitting with Rip Van Dam. Uh, we didn't recognize him because we've never seen him before, but we certainly do know of his reputation. Mr. Hamilton rose when Chambers spoke his name. He has come forward to the bench. The spectators burst into spontaneous applause when they heard his name, and the bailiffs are now trying to quiet them. Their reaction is not at all surprising, for with Andrew Hamilton pleading his case, John Peter Zenger's cause is no longer hopeless. Hamilton is a brilliant trial lawyer. He has a long and remarkable record of courtroom victories. He is a man in his early 80s. Some time ago, he retired from active practice, but he apparently has come out of retirement to defend Zenger. Now, Zenger, the underdog, has at least a fighting chance. At last, the crowd has quieted down. Now, back to the bench. Uh, uh, Mr. Hamilton, Your Honor. I'm ready to take the oath. Uh, the, the oath. Uh, yes, yes, of course, yes, the oath. Well, uh, now raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear that at this bar you will abide by the laws of our Lord and Majesty the King and all the ordinances pertaining to the trial of this case? I do. We, uh, we welcome you to our bar, Mr. Hamilton. I thank you, Your Mr. Hamilton is now taking his place at the defense table. If it were anyone else, Justice Delancey might possibly have refused the oath, but just couldn't refuse it to Andrew Hamilton. That's the gavel again. The trial will proceed. Uh, the clerk will panel the jurors. Robert Sinclair, Joseph Dillingham, Charles Osborne, Daniel Forsyth. Objection, Your Honor. Objection to what, Mr. Chambers? I humbly move, Your Honor, that that the sheriff be instructed to read the names of the jurors in the same order as they appear in the freeholder's book. How, how is that? Are they not in that order? No, sir, they are not. Some of the names that were last on the panel are now placed first. Uh, Clark, uh, is it so? Uh, look on that copy. Is it a true copy of the panel? Uh, yes, I believe it is. Well, then how is it that some of the names are misplaced? have the list is handed to me by the sheriff. Mm, yes, yes. Well, well then, uh, I say, uh, someone must be in error. Yes. Well, well, now, uh, put aside the list you've read and uh, read the names from the freeholder's book in the order they do appear. Yes, Your Honor. 
Apparently, some attempt to obtain a jury favor of the Crown has been frustrated. Normally, a jury is selected from a list of names known as the Freeholders' Book, and customarily the names are called in order. Here, however, someone evidently shuffled the names so that the list contained a number of men who are known to favor the governor. Whatever the reasons behind the maneuver, quite obviously it has failed. And now, as the clerk finishes reading off the true list, the jurors, most of whom are middle-class merchants and farmers, are filing into the jury box, and they're all in there now, standing and waiting. Do you have any challenges, Mr. Chambers? No, Your Honor, the defense is satisfied. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, are you too satisfied? Uh, we, uh, uh, that is the crown. Uh, yes, yes. I, uh, of course, yes, yes, the crown is happy. Uh, very happy indeed. Uh, well, uh, swear in the jury. Uh, Mr. Thomas Hunt, as foreman of this jury, do you swear that you shall well and truly try and true deliverance make between our sovereign lord, the king, and the prisoner at the bar whom you have in your charge, and a true verdict give according to your evidence? So help you God? I do. Gentlemen, the same oath which your foreman has taken on his behalf, you and every one of you shall well and truly observe and keep on your honor. Repeat after me, I do. I do. Be seated. <coughs> The jurors now seat themselves, and the long-awaited trial of John Peter Zenger actually begins. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, will you proceed? <coughs> Very pleased, Your Honor, that uh, gentlemen of the jury, the charge against the defendant, John Peter Zenger, is that he did willfully and maliciously print a false, scandalous, and seditious libel in which His Excellency, the Governor of this province, who is the King's immediate representative here, is greatly and unjustly scandalized as a person that has no regard to law nor justice. <clears throat> Such libeling has always been discouraged as a thing that tends to create differences among men ill blood among the people, and our times great bloodshed. And there can be no doubt but that you, gentlemen of the jury, will condemn these practices and find the defendant guilty as charged. Uh, Mr. Chambers. Your Honours, gentlemen of the jury, my client, John Peter Zenger, pleads not guilty to the charge. We shall attempt to show that none of the alleged libels refer directly to any specific person. And we shall also point out that it is incumbent upon the Crown to prove that the defendant is the author of the said libels. Your Honours, my respectable but very young colleague has stated that it is necessary for the Crown to show that Zenger personally is responsible for the appearance of the libels in the so-called newspaper he publishes. It shall be my happy duty to prove this beyond reasonable doubt. My witnesses will show... Yours, uh, may I be forgiven for interrupting the discourse of the learned attorney for the crowd? Uh, what is the nature of your interruption, Mr. Hamilton? Uh, may it please, Your Honours, I will save the Attorney General the trouble of going further into the matter. For I do confess for my client that he both printed and published the statements set forth in the charges. As you heard, Mr. Hamilton has surprisingly admitted that Sanger printed and published the alleged libels. Now the Attorney General again. As Mr. Hamilton has confessed the printing and publishing of these libels, I think the jury must find the verdict for the King. Not so neither, Mr. Attorney General. There is more to this bargain. Now, I hope uh, it is not our bare printing and publishing a paper that will make it a libel. You will have something more to do before you make my client a libeler. For the words themselves must be libelous. That is, false, scandalous, and seditious. Or else we are not guilty. 
your honours. I think nothing is plainer than that the words contained in the articles as pertaining to the governor are scandalous and tend to sedition. And if such a thing is not liable, I think it may be said that there can be no such thing as a lie. Uh, may it uh, please your honours, uh, I must insist that what my client is charged with is not a lie. I observed just now that uh, Mr. Attorney General, in defining a libel, made use of the words scandalous and seditious. But whether from design or not, I cannot say, he omitted the word uh, false. I repeat, a libel is still a libel, notwithstanding it may be true. In this, I must again differ with my honorable colleague. I point out to him that the indictment to which my client pleaded not guilty, accused him of, I quote, a certain false, malicious, seditious, and scandalous libel. Now, Your Honor, the word false must have some meaning, or else uh, how came it there? <laughs> to show the court that I am in earnest, and to save the court's time and Mr. Attorney General's trouble, I will agree that everything Mr. Zenger printed about His Excellency the Governor is scandalous, seditious, and a libel, provided only that he proves them false. So it seems our work is now pretty much shortened. All the Crown is left to do is prove the word false, and we are guilty. If he is reluctant to do that, we shall take the task upon ourselves and uh, prove them true. Uh, Mr. Hamilton, uh, you cannot be permitted to give the truth of a libel in evidence. A libel is not to be justified, for it is nevertheless a libel that it is true. Your Honor, I'm sorry the court has so quickly decided upon this bit of law. Uh, the law is clear. You cannot justify a libel. With submission, I have seen the practice in very great court. Mr. Hamilton, after the court have declared their opinion, it is not good manners to insist upon a point in which you are overruled. Your Honor, I must insist on use the court with good manners, sir. You are not to be permitted to argue against the opinion of the court. Then I will say no more at this time. Mr. Hamilton has now turned his back on the bench, almost deliberately, it seems, and he is approaching the jury. Apparently, he intends to skip the pleading, the evidence, and to go at once to the final summing up before the jury. Mr. Hamilton. Gentlemen of the jury, it is to you we must now appeal. For witness, we are denied the liberty of proving the truth of the facts deemed libelous. Gentlemen, power may be justly compared to a great river. While kept within its bounds, it is both beautiful and useful. But when it overflows its banks, it bears down all before it. And it brings destruction and desolation wherever it comes. If then this is the nature of power, let us at least do our duty. And like wise men who value freedom, Use our utmost care to support liberty. The only bulwark we have against lawless power, which in all ages has sacrificed to its wild lust and boundless ambition the blood of the best men that ever lived. As you see, I labor under the weight of many years and am borne down with the great infirmities of body. Yet, old and weak as I am, I should think it my duty, if required, to go to the furthest part of the land where my service could be of any use in assisting to quench the flame of prosecutions that aim to deprive a people of the right of remonstrating I am complaining too against arbitrary attempts of the men in power. Men who injure and oppress the people under their administration 
reluctant, cry out and complain, and then make that very complaint the foundation for new oppressions and persecutions. Gentlemen, I make no doubt but your upright conduct this day will entitle you to the love and esteem of your fellow citizens. For every man who prefers freedom to a life of slavery will bless and honor you as men who have baffled an act of tyranny. Gentlemen of the jury, your impartial and uncorrupt verdict today will lay a noble foundation for securing to ourselves our posterity and our neighbors, that to which nature and the laws of our country have given us a right, the liberty, both of exposing and opposing arbitrary power by speaking and writing the truth. The question before the court and you, gentlemen of the jury, is not of small nor private concern. It is not the cause of a poor printer, nor of New York alone, which you are now trying. No. It may, in its consequence, affect every free man in America. It is the best cause. It is the cause of liberty. Defense rests. Mr. Attorney General, will you uh, sum up for the Crown? Well, <coughs> I, uh, that is, uh, gentlemen of the jury, uh, all that you have to consider is the fact that Mr. Zenger, the defendant, printed and published certain scandalous libels which reflected upon the integrity of His Excellency the Governor. Well, these are confessed. Well, yes, they are confessed. Well, now, I'm certain you must find the defendant guilty as charged. But yes, yes, of course. <clears throat> the car rest. Mr. Bradley's summation was brief, certainly. He seems to be stunned, still under the power of Mr. Hamilton's oratory. Chief Justice uh, Delancey is about to begin his charge to the jury. Uh, gentlemen of the jury, uh, my charge to you shall be most brief. I wish to remind you that as the facts or words in the charges are confessed, the only thing that can come in question before you is whether the words as set forth in the charges constitute a libel. Now, as that is a matter of law, you may leave that question in the hands of the court. In other words, gentlemen, you, as a jury, have only to decide facts, not law. The facts being confessed, your duty is obvious. Bailiff, remove the jury to its chamber for deliberation. The court will recess. Chief Justice uh, Delancey and his charge to the jury practically instructed it to bring in a verdict of guilty against John Peter Zenger. There's a confusion of emotions here in this courtroom, a mixture of fear and of hope. Don Hollenbeck has made his way to the defense table. He is at Mr. Andrew Hamilton's side. So now over to Don Hollenbeck. Mr. Hamilton, that was a most eloquent and moving summation. How, how were you brought into this case? Who brought you here? I was first informed of Mr. Zenger's predicament by Mr. Rip Van Dam. And what verdict, sir, do you think the jury will bring in? I think they will find, as their conscience instructs them... But even if they do find Zinger not guilty, won't they expose themselves to retaliation by the governor and his party? After all, even, even after this trial, these men will still have to live here in New York City. Yes, and they must now determine just how they shall live, whether as free citizens... Or as slaves. Thank you, Mr. Andrew Hamilton. And now here's Mrs. Anna Zinger. Mrs. Zinger, did you know that Mr. Hamilton was going to be here today, that he was going to defend your husband? No. 
smile. It was a complete, a wonderful surprise. His words were great words. No matter how the trial comes out, no matter what happens now, may I... I should like to acknowledge the deep debt that we, that my husband and I, owe to Andrew Hamilton. He is wonderful. Thank you, Mrs. Anna Zinger. The bailiff is calling the court to order now, so back to John Bailey. The bailiff's call for order is no doubt the signal that the jury is returning. Of course, the jury will not be allowed to return to the courtroom until order is complete here. And there's been a great deal of excited chatter and uh, comment about the magnificent summation of Mr. Hamilton. However, now the people are returning to their seats, are nearly all seated. The judges, as a matter of fact, are entering the courtroom and taking their places. The jury has reached its verdict in a remarkably short time, and yes, here come the jurors now. They're filing into the jury box. The spectators have finally cleared the aisles and are all in their seats, those who have seats. Justice Delancey is looking over to the jury box, waiting for the jurymen to get finally settled. Now there's a sudden hush uh, over the courtroom. There's the gavel and back to the bench. You may proceed, Mr. Clark. Gentlemen of the jury, have you agreed upon a verdict? We have. Do you find the defendant, John Peter Zanger, guilty of printing and publishing the libels as charged? We find John Peter Zanger not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Is not guilty. John Peter Zenger has been acquitted of the charges against him. The principle that truth can be used as a defense against the charge of libel is upheld. Zenger is free. The courtroom here is in an uproar. People are rushing forward to congratulate Zenger and Hamilton. Mrs. August 4, 1735. John Peter Zenger is acquitted. And the American colonies win a free press to spearhead their fight for independence. You have been listening to The Trial of John Peter Zenger, another broadcast in the series You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Sheon. The Trial of John Peter Zenger was written by Irv Tunick and Mr. Sheon. Walter Hamden played Mr. Andrew Hamilton. Inga Adams was Anna Zenger. D.A. Clark Smith was Justice Delancey. Bernard Lenro played Attorney General Bradley. Richard Newton was John Chambers. And the cast included Guy Sorrell, Bert Cowlin, Van Marlow, and others. Next week... October 4th, 1066, England. The Battle of Hastings. You are there. CBS is proud of its Sunday programming, which brings you distinguished drama like You Are There and fine music from the New York Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra, which follows over most of these stations. CBS Sunday nights are filled with a remarkable array of talent as well. Tonight, for example, over most of these CBS stations, you will hear Van Johnson starring on the Prudential Hour. You'll hear Spike Jones, Amos and Andy, Dashiell Hammett's Sam Spade, Broadway's Helen Hayes, and Hollywood's Eve Arden. They'll all be here tonight... And in case you think we've made a big omission, Jack Benny will be here on all of these stations with his guests, Claudette Colbert and Vincent Price. This is CBS, Jack Benny's radio address, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>